really sorry I can't be there because I love the 5x15 events, I love the interaction with the audience and with the other speakers. These amazing other speakers that I, you know, I'm just the warm up act for all the people that are going to come, come afterwards in this 6x12, it's not, yeah, whatever acreage this event has uh, this evening. Um, yeah, I usually try to be quite funny, but I hope I'm not going to be too miserable this evening, But because we are talking about this virus, which has been you know, a devastating thing for so many people and has had such an impact on, on society. But can I just at the first slide, please, Daisy, can you put up you know, my inevitable uh, plug that I've got to do for my book, Ta -da! The Art of Statistics, and um, it's very good. And it's selling very well, in fact, as part of this, um, uh, this crisis, because, you know, there are so many statistics around. And what this book emphasizes is actually, could I have the next slide, please, Daisy? I'd just like to put up the first quote I've got in the book, because this actually is the whole theme for the book and my talk today. Data does not speak for itself. There's a lovely quote from Nate Silver I'm going to use. Um, the numbers of no way are speaking for themselves. We speak for them. We imbue them with meaning. Now, because we you can take that slide off for a moment, Dave, please. Lovely. So, um, you know, we know we've been awash with data. We get the briefings. We get told how many tests were done. Well, of course, you know, they weren't. It's how many were posted out, perhaps. And how many people have died? We've heard today 11 deaths. No, there weren't 11 deaths because it's a Monday and you get fewer being reported on a Monday. Although it's, it's, it's very good that there are only 11 deaths being reported from COVID. So I think we've learned in, over this epidemic to, to appreciate the numbers, but take them with some caution. And that's actually what the book is about. The fact is not about fancy analyses and doing very clever things. It's purely about thinking about what the numbers mean and being rather cautious about interpreting them. And in particular, this idea that whatever we do, whatever numbers we've got, all they do is generate more questions. They give some insight and they generate more questions. So that I'd like to just address two issues. Um, the first one, and I'm afraid they're both to do with deaths from COVID, because that's the data I've been mainly looking at. The first one is about excess deaths. And, um, you know, I think people are familiar with the fact that that really counts how many deaths we're having more than we'd normally expect at this time of year. And, um, and it's been reported now excess deaths, there's no excess deaths in the country. We were back essentially to normal in terms of the total number of deaths happening this week. Great. However, if we just look a little bit deeper, we find out it's not as simple as that. And could I have the first, the next slide, please, Daisy? This is from an app we produced. You can go onto the web and play with this and find out, get these graphs for all different areas, different parts of the country. And I um, just want to take you through it. The top left shows what's happened in care homes over the, over the epidemic. The red are deaths from COVID and the, uh, the other color, I don't know what color it is really, turquoise or whatever, whatever it is, um, shows that there have been a huge number of additional non-COVID deaths in care homes. The dashed line is what we'd normally expect. And um, many of these are thought to be, perhaps most of them, uh, actually under diagnosis. People with COVID, especially elder, elderly with dementia, very difficult to make a firm diagnosis. They, they show very different symptoms. So that's what's happened in care homes, rather shocking. If we look in hospitals, we can see a, a great big peak in deaths in hospital, peaking on April the 8th, um, and, uh, and starting in mid-March when they essentially emptied the hospitals back into the community, thus, it is said, leading to, of course, this, this then this peak in care homes. But look at what else has happened in hospitals. Look at what's happened to the non-COVID deaths, a big dip actually 14,000 fewer non-COVID deaths in hospitals than we'd expect because people haven't been going to hospitals. They haven't wanted to go there and they haven't wanted, been, people haven't been wanting to be sent, the GPs haven't been wanting to send people there. So where have those deaths been happening? Have a look at the top right, what's been happening in homes. We don't hear anything about this. We don't hear any stories. These are all individual stories that have happened to individual families. No organizations, no great coverage. Actually very few COVID deaths, in, in at home, but vastly 15,000 extra non COVID deaths at homes have essentially been exported from hospital. So these are people who would normally have gone to hospital and died there and are dying at home. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Most people would prefer to die at home, and particularly during this period, dying in hospital, you know, has not been um, a very good experience for many people I think, and their families. And so, this is not necessarily such a bad thing if these have been deaths with some quality about them but we don't know that and we don't know how many of these people might have lived longer had they gone to hospital 
So this, this, uh, this picture shows that the fact that there are no excess deaths now actually obscures the fact that there are still hundreds of 700 or so a week of extra deaths happening at home that would normally happen in the hospital. And it just raises the question of what has this been like in people's homes? Okay, so could I lose that slide for a minute, Daisy? Let me talk about risks and the risks to us. Now, I, I must always emphasize that risk about COVID is not just to us personally, it's about to the greater community to which we have a big duty. But let's look for the moment at the risks to us. I'm 66, if I got COVID, uh, it's estimated my risk of dying from it would be about one in 70 of people my age. Very similar to the average risk of someone my age dying and before the next year, before their next birthday, because that's roughly how it works. Your risk of dying if you get COVID is roughly the same as you as the risk of, that you would have anyway in the subsequent year. Now, what about um, a younger person? But we, our group has been doing lots of surveys. People have been lots, doing lots of surveys on people's attitudes and fears and anxieties about COVID and finding there's almost no age gradient, that the younger people are almost as anxious about it to themselves, the risk to themselves, as older people. Well, is this reasonable? Okay, my risk is about one in 70. What about a young, what about a 26 year old, someone who's 40 years younger? Well, you know, it's less, the risk is less than one in 70. Is it one in 700? Is it, no, it's one in 7,000. It's about 100 times less than my risk if a 26 year old, average 26 year old, gets COVID. We must remember that, you know, 80% of, 80, 90% of COVID deaths happen to people with pre-existing medical conditions. And so that, you know, the, the, the risk to healthy people is a lot lower than, than the average risk. But this is a staggering difference in, in, in risk according to age. And it's even less for school kids. I, I mean, you know, five to 14 year old school kids, seven million of them, there's still only been three registered deaths from COVID. That's one in two million. Okay, there have been some hospitalizations. I'm not saying that there's no, uh, no illness at all. However, the risks are tiny compared with the normal risks over the, over the period of the, of the epidemic. 130 or so school kids have died from other causes. So I think it's best to try to get this in perspective. And could I have the, the final slide, please? Now this is, it looks fairly complicated. If we look on the right hand side, this is the risk out of 100,000 people of different ages of them dying during this epidemic, during the peak of the epidemic. And this is the classic exponential curve. It goes along very low until actually just about at my age, about 66, it starts shooting up in the air. And this is the classic pattern you get when risk increases for every year you get older. And in fact, COVID death rates increase from about 12 to 13%. They double every five to six years. That means someone's 20 years older has got 10 times the risk and so on. So if we look on the left, the, we can see what's happening to younger people. We see, and this is extraordinary, um, amazingly straight lines in terms of the death rates on this logarithmic scale. That means a constant proportional increase with every year you get older, your risk of dying is increased by about 12 to 13%. It means that for older people in their 90s, one in 50 have died. Amazing, you know, they, they, more than two percent have died of over people of COVID over the period of the epidemic. But for younger people, it's been tiny. In fact, young men aged between twenty and twenty-five, their death rates are lower than normal because they've actually benefited by not being able to go out and drive and drink and, and so on. So their death rates are actually lower than normal. So I think it's very difficult as someone who specialises in risk communication to communicate. We can finish with that now, Daisy. Thank you. To, finish, to communicate this massive range in risk that we're facing. Um, there are calculators uh, being developed, already developed, I'm working on one with a team that will provide this information to individuals in the future, because we need to bear in mind that this was the risks during the peak of the epidemic, as in the future they're going to be far less, because we're never going to allow something like that to happen again, because we'll be closing down, I hope we don't have to, but we would be closing down um, in, in the way that we've all become all too familiar with. So this, we're never going to see anything like that again. This is the risk in the future will be far lower than I've described. But of course I mentioned, I've got to mention again, which we need to take into account the risk to others and we need to take into account um, the fact that there is, could be long-term morbidity for, for survivors of COVID. But I do, I suppose my plea is that uh, when thinking about, I know you, we're not all rational beings, I'm not a rational being at all, I can't control my feelings, my anxieties, but maybe just think a little bit about what the risks really are before you, um, before you 
express your anxiety about, about COVID. Okay, so I'm really sorry to have got off to such a gloomy start. I, I could have told a whole lot of funny stories about awful experiences I've had as a statistician dealing with the media, uh, which has been wonderful. But over this period, I've been stitched up, I've made mistakes, I've made a fool of myself, but I've also had some quite good moments. So, but I thought instead of telling a string of jokes, as I usually do on these 5 by 15s, um, I would try to illustrate the importance of thinking about data and um, asking questions about data, because data never tell us all the answers. They just generate the question, more questions. So with that, I'm going to pass back to the remainder of this extraordinary evening and settle down and en enjoy the show. And again, thank Daisy so much for inviting me to participate in this event. Thank you very much indeed.